chapter 18, verse number one. Uh, as we uh, gather today, I, I am well aware of all the things that are happening uh, in the world, the things that continue to cause so many of us uh, great, great uh, conflict and turmoil. Uh, the things happening in our society, the things happening in our families, the things happening in our communities. And, uh, and yet I also am reminded that we are a people who can constantly can hold on to God's unchanging hand and, uh, and know that the, the weapons that we are being asked to employ on behalf of the kingdom and work of God, uh, how many of you know they always have the power to defeat every enemy? Amen. Every enemy outside of you, every enemy within you, and every enemy beyond you, that the power of God is uh, still alive and at work. And so this passage of scripture is uh, one that I uh, was brought to as I was thinking about uh, us moving into the season of Advent, which is starting next week, and uh, the kind of transitions that we are about to make uh, in this the last... uh, 30, 40 days of the year, Um, and as we approach uh, the arrival of Jesus through the Christmas uh, liturgical uh, practices, I I am aware that there are often some bumps in the road that we're going to have to endure, and uh, I find this passage to be so important given everything that's happening, and it is the Lucan account of what is called the parable of the widow and the unjust judge. It is uh, this opportunity for us to learn uh, through Jesus' storytelling expertise the ways in which God constantly delivers victory and uh, strength to the people of God as we work through our journey here uh, on earth. And uh, if you're like me, I, I, I love uh, to know uh, when, when uh, the parousia was happening, when we can just go on and be in heaven and not have to deal with all the foolishness down here. How many, how many of y'all looking forward to that day? Amen. We used to sing a song back in the day, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that would be. When we all see Jesus, we will sing and shout the victory. But I'm one of these folks who also believe we ain't got to wait until the battle is over. We don't have to wait till we get to heaven to experience a little bit of this here on earth. And yet, at times, it seems like heaven is delayed. Have you ever had a moment in your life where you feel like, God, trouble is present and deliverance is delayed? Well, uh, I do believe that Jesus is well aware of the, the challenge of delays, the challenge of what do we do when uh, the time clock and the calendar uh, does not mesh with our calendar, our pace. And uh, here we find Jesus speaking uh, to his disciples, people who were following Jesus, who were trying to figure out who Jesus really was, trying to understand what it meant to follow Jesus. Jesus speaks to them in this way, uh, Luke chapter 18, verse number one. Uh, Hopefully it's on the screen uh, really soon here. Uh, But uh, trust me, I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version, and the scripture says this, then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. And Jesus said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. And in that city, there was a widow who kept coming to the judge saying, grant me justice against my opponent. For a while the judge refused, but later the judge said to himself, though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. Uh, Amen. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm just going to keep reading. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will God delay long in helping them? I tell you. God will quickly grant justice to them, and yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? 
It's the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. I'm going to speak from the top for a few moments. Before I let go. Before I let go. Uh huh. Uh, let's pray. God, we want to say thank you, Lord, for the word of God that has been read for the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please send the anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest upon me and even the hearers of your word. And we'll say thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of the way say amen. Now, one of our most difficult tasks as followers of Jesus will be to stay the course, to walk the path of righteousness, to walk the path of right belief, to walk the path of right action, to walk the path of persistence particularly when the road curves and bends in ways we did not anticipate. If the COVID-19 pandemic has taught us anything, it has brought into sharp clarity the fragility of life. That life, even with all of our plans, can be radically interrupted with things we did not plan for. And if the events of the past week have taught us nothing else, it has reminded us that our lives as black folks, indigenous folk, queer and trans folks, even among the rich and the poor, none of us are exempt from the struggles of life. That you could be doing everything right as you know to do and trouble can come knocking on your door. Anybody get a knock on your door recently? Amen. It's like, I, I fasted, I prayed, I tithed, I served, I, I worked out, I, 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 I turned in my paper, I said I was sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. And trouble didn't skip past my door this week. It didn't skip, skip past my door this month. And so as we come to the penultimate week before Advent, we are entering a time where families and friends, we all going to have to sit across some tables up in here. Some of you shaking your head. I see the few saying that they said troubles. That tr I see trouble on the horizon. Praise God. <laughs> said, said, uh, y'all be celebrating uh, all these holidays. I be asking this cup to pass from me. Because in some of our places, there's a reason why we move halfway across the country. Amen. <laughs> There's a reason why don't nobody know where you live at, amen. There's a reason why, amen, I'm not talking to nobody in here. I'm talking to the way that's everywhere. But one of the great things about the gospel is that it constantly reminds us that there is always room in the kingdom of God for everybody. Even the people you don't like, the people you can't get along with, the people who rub you the wrong way. But but affirming that there is room for them need not require you to be subject to the whims of their wickedness. How I many know sometimes, even as we gather, we got to have some boundaries up in here. We got to have some guidelines. We got to have some red, bright lines in the sand that will remind both yourself and them that both of us are too valuable to contribute to the spiral of each other's lives into despair. The universality of the gospel that is often written and reflected in the Lucan accounts is to remind us that even though Jesus comes as a dark-skinned Palestinian Jew to a particular people at a particular time, the kingdom of God that follows Jesus is made available to whosoever will to let them come. The kingdom of God is often juxtaposed over and against the systems and the structures of this world that are designed to deliver you freedom and liberation, not on their own. The, the, the kingdom of God is often uh, reminding you and I of the limitations of human systems and human constructions and narratives and names and descriptions that often like to drill down to that which is different from one another rather than helping us to hold fast to that which we carry together. 
And like many things in our lives, how many of you know what we want must be followed with the actions that reflect our commitment to that which we long for? If we want community, how many of you know you have to lean into community? If you want healing, you have to lean into healing. If you want healthy families and relationships, you got to lean into healthy families and relationships. And, and I have found that it is easier in particularly the work that we've done uh, over the last 15 years or so here in this region and across the country, that it's easier to let go of those things that you have little proximity to. It's easy to walk away from certain kinds of folks if you don't know their names, if you don't know their struggle. It's easy to throw in the towel on certain projects when you have not put any work on it. Amen. If you ain't put five on it, it's easy to, 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 to just, you know, say, oh, no, I, don't, I don't have no investment in this thing. But how many of you know that there are some things that we have invested in that we must be willing to fight for? There are some, some things in our lives that, that, that you and I must not be willing to walk away from. And I want you to know that there will be moments in your life where you will have an internal impulse, an internal uh, catalyst, something that will not allow you to let go, to let go of God's promise, to let go of God's expectation, to let go of what God is doing, even away from your view. Because how many of you know sometimes the best work that God does is in the nighttime? It's when all the lights are off. It's when you done laid it down to sleep. It's when you done all you can. God says, thank you. I was waiting for you just to take a step back and give me some room to do a miracle. Huh, do I have any miracles walking up in here a few times in your life where you know if it had not been for God, Ooh, Jesus, my God. And, 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 and so I want you to know that there's something inside you, child of God. There's something inside you that, that is more than a fleeting feeling or a passing thought. And in this story, you and I get an opportunity to see uh, what it looks like when you have conviction of principle versus an assignment grounded in power. You have a positionally powerful man, a judge, and he is being engaged by a socially vulnerable woman who is a widow. This judge has no regard for God, and he does not see that there is a power that is greater than his own. Be careful, child of God, when you get so confident in your own power, in your own position, in your own degrees, in your own money, in your own whatever, that you lose out in your regard for a power that's greater than yourself. I mean, I, I, I found out those moments when I kind of start to feel myself, you know, I'd be like, you know, McBride, you kind of all right. <laughs> Uh, God knows how to pull a, a, a rug from up underneath you. And you be on your back and you be looking up to God. And then you get reminded. <laughs> Amen. I thought I could see everything while I was standing up. But now I'm on my back, praise God. And I realize that there is a power that's greater than me. Child of God, you must always remind yourself. That no matter what human being or system you stand in front of, there is a power that is greater than them. No, more, no trial that you stand in front of, no circumstance that you stand in front of, no issue or struggle that you can stand in front of is greater than the power of the living God. And that's why I love this woman who, who, who is standing before this judge. She has a full awareness of her limitations. She understands that she can't fix this situation without the power of someone greater than her. But she is not detoured by the obstacles. 
And I believe Jesus introduces this parable to expose the limitations of the judge and his powerful system while revealing the endless possibilities of a persistent vessel of God. And I want you to know, child of God, in this story, you always want to be the persistent vessel of God. In this story, you always want to be the one who can uh, be assured that no matter who is in the position I am appealing to, I will not let go. I will not be the one who shrinks in the face of that which seems to be more powerful than I. It could be the boss on your job. It could be the professor at your university. It could be the doctor in the sick room. It could be the lawyer in the courtroom. It could be the mayor, the governor, the president, the ambassador. It could be the chancellor. But you must make sure in your mind huh, that you, you can say to yourself, I will not let go of that which is inside of me, causing me to remain persistent. And in this story, Identify with the persistent vessel of God. I mean, I, I wonder in your own story, uh, who do you identify with the most? Who do you naturally gravitate to on a daily basis? Dr. King, he says it like this, that I choose to identify with the underprivileged. I choose to identify with the poor. I choose to give my life for the hungry. If it means dying for them, I'm going that way. Because I heard a voice saying, do something for others. Some of us, amen, are, are the others that, that God is talking about. Some of us are the, the, the widow in this story. Many of you know that I was in Oklahoma City for the last several months off and on, uh, responding to a call that I received from uh, a dear friend and a family whose, whose son was on death row, scheduled to be executed. And, and, you know, I, I, I promised myself, amen, once COVID hit, that I was done with all the rapid response all across the country. I said, you know, I put in my time. I'm tired, my neck and my back and my back and my neck. And I'm, this is a young person's game. Somebody say amen. I said, I'm, I'm going to try to be a, uh, you know, be, be a little homebody. But there was something about the letter I received from a young man named Julius Jones that, 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 that compelled me to, to, to say, I must, I, I must at least, you know, uh, respond. And, 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 and my friend, a few years ago, the Reverend C.C. Jones Davis uh, reached out and, 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 and told me what was happening. So, you know, I tried to offer as much support as I can while I was doing everything else. Amen. But as the, as the effort began to pick up steam and as we began to see that we had some real life widows, Going up against some judges who did not regard God or any power greater than themselves. Amen. I, I began to say to myself, who am I to sit on the sideline? Amen. And sometimes God will put some people in your life that will pull you off the sideline. Man, I, I, I'd be remiss. I, I, I see their pictures. This is all the way to, to your left, Antoinette Jones, the sister of Julius Jones. A wonderful, beautiful uh, sister who was uh, maybe not his age when her brother got taken away. And, and she, all her life, the last 20 years, has been having to shout from the mountaintops that her brother was with her the night this crime happened. But no one would believe her because she was a black little girl in Oklahoma and they questioned her integrity. You had a mother in the middle, Mama, Mama Jones, we call her, a church woman who was also at home. They wouldn't believe a black woman who's a church woman because the cost of a white businessman's life was more valuable and, 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 and crucial than the witnesses of some black folk who knew that their son was not engaged in such a horrific crime. Then you have Reverend C.C. Jones Davis, someone who's not from Oklahoma, who just happened to be in Oklahoma. 2018 and heard about this case through uh, a documentary. And, and as I began to learn more and more about this, I began to realize sometimes we got some real life widows in our lives. 
Folk who need help and who need support and who are looking for God's people to stand with them and not be so suspicious of their motives and their narratives. And I, I'm here to tell you that just like these folks on the screen had to fight for 20 years to get a right hearing. I want you to know over those 20 years, the church was not always ready to put all their chips down on these kind of folk. Because some of us like to be next to respectable, high-powered people. And when you, your life and your, your, your opportunity gets, gets, you know, compromised because you're trying to identify with the hurting among us, the women among us, the queer among us, the poor among us, the abused, the incarcerated. Some folk get nervous. Oh, no, my contract is wrapped up. Amen. My tenure, praise God. I can't mess with my tenure. I got a mortgage to pay. Come on, McBride, you being unreasonable up in here. Amen. How many ever had to make a hard decision? You realize that I got, I got you, know, you know, this ain't no zero-sum gain up in here. This is going to be a sacrifice. But I am here to tell you that all around us, we are surrounded by these kind of widows. They are the archetype. They are the description of the people that we as a church are called to put our chips down on when the rubber meets the road. And in your family and in your neighborhood and in your community and even within yourself, can you place a bet on the holy possibilities that are revealed to those who refuse to let go? Can you take some, some risk and, and say that I am willing to suffer with the righteous? I am willing to lean into some, some, some tough places. Why? Because uh, I know that in my life I may have a season where I need somebody to lean in for me. And God forbid I don't have a, a community of folk that are willing to stand up and say in these times of great tumult and challenge, I have not put in to the relational bank some, some work that allows me to have somebody standing next to me as an outgrowth of what God has called us as a community to do. And so if you're like me, this message is for you. It's to help underscore what we must do before you let go. Before you let go, child of God, I want to give you some lessons from this story about what you and I are called to do. Because there is a moment in your life where you must look from to the right and the left. You must look up and down and you must pat yourself on the chest and say, I refuse to let go. Oh, come on. Just do that right now. Say, I refuse. I, I, I refuse to let go. I refuse to throw in the towel. I refuse to allow my circumstance to define the depths of my commitment. Sometimes I must stand still on the promises of God and say, though you slay me, yet will I trust him. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. So the first thing that I want to say to you from the passage, uh, Jesus simply tells the parable and he says it like this, that this parable is about their need to pray. Not just pray, but pray always and not to lose heart. That's the first thing I want you to, to acknowledge today, that before you let go, you must not, not stop praying. Somebody say, don't stop praying. Say it again, don't stop praying. How many of you know sometimes you can be hanging from a cliff and, and you can be feeling like, you know, uh, I'm losing my grip. And, and when I lose my grip, I'm going to go back to the kinds of, you know, uh, tactics that I use before I learn these spiritual practices. How many got a memory of what you used to do before you started doing spiritual practices? Uh huh. When trouble came your way, amen, you didn't look to the prayer and the fasting, amen. You looked to the, you know, to the knuckles and the, and the elbows. Somebody say amen. Some of us, amen, you know, your, your prayer language was, you know, four-letter words. <laughs> amen. Thank you, Jesus. Some of you still got them, amen. They, 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 they bear a little deep, praise God. Mm -hmm. Amen. But if you, if you push them too hard, <laughs> oh, somebody said they don't make the saints like they used to, Amen. But how many of you know sometimes you can, you can get in a situation and desperation can drive you to a place where you 
forget that which brought you over. I want you to know that desperation can drive you either to personal despair or it can drive you to transcendent dependence. Desperation can either cause you to turn inward and fall back on your limited power, or it could cause you to look upward and say, God, I need your help. And that is what prayer is designed to do. Prayer is designed to keep you in a connection with God. It's designed to be a reciprocal communication with God. It's not just you talking to God without waiting for God to talk back. It's not you just giving God a whole lot of, you know, your your deepest confessions without God getting an opportunity to respond to you with his deepest affirmations. That prayer that is littered with confession, prayer that is grounded in inquiry, Prayer that exudes lament and worship at the same time. This is the proper response to desperation. That when I get desperate, I'm going to pray. And when I pray, I'm not going to give God platitudes. I'm not going to try to trick God in my prayers. I'm not going to try to tell God what I think God wants to hear in my prayers. But I am going to understand that prayer is an opportunity for me to verbalize that which God already knows is in my heart. Because sometimes you got to let it out of your mouth in order for you to follow what you said with action. And how many of you know that prayer as action is often the most elusive part of prayer? Sometimes we pray and stay stationary. But I think it was, uh, who was it? Maybe uh, 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 Fannie Lou Hamer or Fairy, just one of them folk that said, uh, I, I, I prayed a thousand prayers but did not get my response till I prayed with my feet. And some of us got to pray with our mouths, but also pray with our feet. And prayer, when, when, when done with your feet, allows you to pray some different prayers. Sometimes I think our prayers are so limited that they reduce the possibility of what and how God can move. I mean, I, you know, pray and, and, you know, my prayers are often, uh, you know, about one thing. And I've I've come to understand that when I pray uh, various kinds of prayers, prayers of confession and precatory prayers, those are the prayers for my enemies to be defeated. Amen. Sometimes I pray prayers of forgiveness, but these days I pray, pray in precatory prayers. Amen. Amen. I was talking with this with Pastor Tracy and she 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 asked me to slow down on the imprecatory prayer. So I'm not going to go too far down the line. Amen. Today until Pastor Tracy gives me a little bit of a reprieve. But how many know sometimes the prayers we pray require the use of scripture? Because the scriptures can say things you would never know to say. Sometimes the prayers we pray need to tap into the mystics. Why? Because they've had revelations that you have yet to have. Sometimes the prayers we pray need to tap into the elders. Why? Because they done seen a little bit more life than you have. Sometimes the prayers we pray need to tap into the saints, which is just to say there are some folk who have a little bit more of a a connection to God than you may have right now. Amen. I've learned I can't have everybody praying for me intentionally. Amen. Generally, you can pray for me. Praise God. Oh, yes, pray for me. Mm -hmm. Please pray for me. But how many know there's some moments in your life where you're going to have to pick and choose? Amen. Amen. Yeah, pray pray for me while you're blessing your food since that's the only time you pray all week. Amen. But, But there's some folk who get up every morning at six in the morning and they praying. I want you to pray for me. There's some folk who come to the to the church house in the midst of COVID. Amen. And only two or three folk walking around. I want you to pray for me. There's some folk who pray through the midnight hour and they're calling out to God on behalf of those who are in need. How many of you know those are the people we want to pray for us? And I believe that our prayers must change in order to meet the season of challenge or triumph we are enduring. And I believe that desperation, when it kicks in, it gives you and I the opportunity to start praying some different prayers. Whatever you do, child of God, don't stop praying. 
That's the first thing you must do before you let go. You say, have I prayed my last prayer yet? I can't let go if I'm still praying for this thing. I'm still calling out to God for this thing. The question then is, how must your prayers change in order to meet the season of challenge you're enduring? And where do you turn when desperation kicks in? The second thing that I want you to know this, this, this text is teaching us is that we must be clear about our adversaries. Be clear about your adversary. Scripture says, amen, that this, this judge, he did not fear God nor had respect for anyone. And sometimes... We don't realize that it is very difficult to defeat a devil you can't name. Sometimes it's hard whenever those those folk filled with demons came to Jesus, Jesus would always ask them a question. What is your name? Amen. Because sometimes you got to name the power, the adversary, the enemy that requires defeat in your life. Sometimes it's important to have some specificity up in here. Walter Wink says that some things must be exposed before they can be disarmed. And some people in our lives have perfected the process of death rather than the pathway to life. That there are systems in this world that have mastered the art of suffering while scoffing at the science of reprieve. While we were in Oklahoma City, we we, we watched how the state prepared itself to execute someone. That some 30 days or six weeks before the execution, they would put a person on death watch. And they would have an execution chamber at the end of the hallway and have cells, six to eight cells, on the way to the execution chamber. And they would put the individual in one cell and every week closer to execution. They will move the person from one cell closer to the execution chamber. They will leave the lights on to make sure that they could monitor this person 24 hours a day. So this person would not take their own life. That in the state of Oklahoma, and dare I say in the United States, we have perfected the art of death and suffering. And some of this has been internalized even within our own selves. How many know it's easier for us to kill one another than it is for us to heal one another? It's easier for us to hold grudges than it is for us to let things go. But I'm here to tell you that there is a way forward where you and I must have a persistence for life. That is much more determined than the engines of death. That's why naming your adversary requires a particular strategy to defeat your adversary. You hear me say it through the years that there are three kinds of enemies we must defeat. The enemy within us, the enemy uh, around us, and the enemy beyond us. The enemy within us is our flesh, it's our desires, it's those things that continually war against our soul. But how many know that's a different enemy than the enemy around us, which is social sin and injustice? Amen. And then you got the enemy beyond you, which is the devil and all the devil's business. I want you to know that each one of these enemies require a certain kind of toolkit that you can't just acquire without, as the scripture says, some prayer and some fasting. That some of these tools require you and I to employ some different kind of spiritual practices uh, and that when you are dealing with trauma you don't need more violence to cure trauma you need some healing and some love lord help me in here when you're dealing with injustice you don't need more injustice to get uh the situation fixed you need to find some folk who are some freedom fighters uh, some folk who understand how the system works and and have some integrity and some passion uh to right some wrongs Uh, when you are dealing with violence you don't need to get bigger guns 
No, you need to perfect the art of making peace with one another. You need to perfect the art of being able, as the scripture says, uh, to turn away wrath with soft answers. Uh, uh I'm here to tell you that there are some moments where you got to name the devil that's staring you in your face. uh, So you can defeat the devil whenever the devil shows up. Uh, There are some times where you need to look in yourself uh, and say, I will not be defeated by this adversary within me I'm not going to deny that I got struggles but I am going to acknowledge that I got a God that is greater I feel a little preachy in here today I know we ain't been together for a while but y'all still remember how we get down at the way you ought to give your neighbor a fake high five and tell him my God is still greater Uh huh. I I want you to know, child of God, that there is a moment in your life uh, where you got to tell the devil uh, that you will not win uh, in my life. Uh, You won't win in my community. Uh, You won't win in my mind. Uh, Oh, God. Uh, Oh, and so the last thing that I need to say to some of us uh, is that before you let go, uh, that you better hold on to your faith. Verse number eight, it says it like this. And yet when the son of man comes, and yet when the son of man comes, and yet when the son of man comes, will he find faith on the earth? The the, the most important word in that verse is when. Somebody holler when. The old saints used to say, he may not come when you want him, but he's always, he's always on time. I wonder, is there anybody in here who understands that it ain't nothing but a matter of when, that God will show up when he gets ready. And our job uh, is to make sure that when God shows up, uh, that he can find some faith in the earth. I love my sister Antoinette uh, that I met in Oklahoma City. Uh, I used to ask her the last few months, uh, Sister Ned, how are you feeling? Uh, On the days that seem so dark, uh, she would say, I just got some peace. Uh, I'm just going to remain peaceful. Uh, I got to be honest uh, uh, that the preacher man uh, was walking around a little nervous. Uh, I was confessing, Lord, uh, I believe. Uh, Help uh, my unbelief. Uh, Sometimes I had to acknowledge uh, both things at the same time. But there was a widow named Antoinette. There was a widow named Mama Jones. There was a widow named Reverend C.C. Jones Davis. And I can recall the day before the execution was scheduled, we drove down to the prison for their last family visit. It was the most excruciating journey I've ever had to make. How do you drive a mother and a sister, a father and a brother, to go see their loved one one day before they're getting ready to die? But I'm here to tell you that there was something inside Sister Antoinette while she was in there visiting with her brother while the clock was still ticking going down to a certain death on her way out the door from her last visit with her brother she looked at the prison folk and said I need to make a scheduled visit to see my brother on this coming Sunday I want you to know will God find faith on the earth is there one who's able to believe that it ain't nothing but a win she didn't tell nobody I sure enough didn't know but when we got the verdict that there was a reprieve that the 
Sunday, the governor had succumbed uh, to a group of faith-filled folk uh, sitting in the hallways of the Capitol, uh, marching in the streets of Oklahoma City, uh, walking out of schools all over the country. Uh, when the governor uh, heard that he could not uh, do such wickedness uh, without a response from the people, uh, it was only then I said it was only then that Antoinette told all of us, well, guess what, y'all? I'm coming back on Sunday to see my brother because I got an appointment. I got an appointment, not with death, not with despair, not with hopelessness, but I got an appointment with life, with faith, with the wind of God. I'm here to tell you today, don't give up the wind. Don't give up the hope. Don't give up the triumph. For God will come through every time. God will come through every time. Hold on to your faith. Hold on to your confidence. Trust and believe that before I let go, God will. God will show up. Woo! And I also know this to be true. That sometimes God's response may not always be the yes we want. But I love it how the theologian says underneath every no from God, you're going to find a yes. Whoo! The answer to that relationship may be no, but underneath that no, there's a yes. The answer to your job may be no, but underneath that no, there's a yes. The answer to your struggle may be no, but underneath that no, that is what it means to hold on to your faith. It means like the children uh, the, the three Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace. They, they were told, bow down or you're going to die. One of them stood up. I'm sure it was the bad Negro of the group. <laughs> ben the Ghost stood up and said, we're not going to bow to your image. Because the God we serve is able. Somebody say able. That was just him saying, when God gets ready, God's going to do something. But then I love this part. He said, and if he chooses not to, <laughs> I'm still not bound. You ought to tell your neighbor, I can't bow. I'm not built to bow. I'm built to shake. I'm built to have a little worry. But something on the inside of me just won't let me let go. Oh, come on, stand with me, everybody. I don't know if you remember the song, Lauren, says, my hiding place, my safe refuge, my treasure, Lord, you are my friend and king, anointed, one, most holy. Most Lift those hands, everybody. My hiding place, say, my hiding place, my, my safe refuge, my treasure, my, my treasure, treasure Lord, you are, you are my friend and king, yes, my friend, anointed one, anointed most one, holy, most holy, hey. God, our hands are lifted to you today. Hallelujah. Our hands are lifted to you today because, God, trouble is in our way. Trial is visiting us. Circumstances in our country, in our city, in our families are reaching a tipping point. 
God, we are like the widow and we keep petitioning to an unjust judge who has no regard for your power. But God, we are constantly aware that endless possibilities follow the persistence of the vessels of God. So God, we will not throw in the towel, but we will keep trusting and believing that no weapon that's formed against us shall prosper. We'll keep trusting and believing that every knee must bow to the power of the living God. We'll keep trusting and believing that if it depends on my faith, God, when you show up, there will be faith on the earth. That when you show up, God, you can cash in on my faith, my persistence, my trust, that you can do anything but fail. So God, as I lift up our hands, as we lift up our hands, it's me, oh Lord, and I stand in the need of prayer. Come on, say that. It's me, oh Lord, and I stand in the need of prayer. It's not my mother, not my father, not my sister, my brother, my sibling, but it's me, oh Lord, and I need you. I need you in this season, God, to stabilize me, to anchor me before I let go. I pray for salvation to those who are in need of salvation today. I pray for the outpouring of your Holy Ghost for those who need your power in their life. I pray, God, for a visitation that is undeniable. And I pray you will do it right now, right now. Somebody say right now, right now, right now. Do it right now, God. We lift up those who are incarcerated. Do it right now, God. We lift up those caught in violence in the neighborhoods. Do it right now, God. We lift up those who are so desperate that they're robbing and stealing. Do it right now, God. We lift up the victims, Lord God, of those who have been victimized by the desperation of others. We ask you, do it right now, God. We lift up our children. We lift up our kids, our babies. Do it right now, God. Save, heal, and deliver. And we'll say thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Before I let go.